So I know you're obviously you're out and about again. You're traveling around, um, and I know you uh, finally got to go to Africa again after a long time of, of not being on the continent. Um, you went to Rwanda and Senegal. Tell us a little bit about just what you saw and what your impressions are of where things progressed for women, where things regressed globally abroad, um, and then we'll get to the US. Okay. <laughs> so yes, the reason I hadn't been out traveling obviously was because of COVID and the pandemic. And uh, finally this summer, um, I got to go out traveling again on the continent, which I always learn because you talk to so many people, men and women, and for me at least that experiential learning is how I learn. And you know, it's interesting. I mean, you have to look globally at where are we as women. And we are further behind than when I was at this conference, I think back in 2014. We are three generations away from gender equality in the world. That's my granddaughter's granddaughters. <laughs> and to me, that's just not acceptable. And so, but when you go places like Senegal and Rwanda, you actually see, I see the hope. So I sat with a group of women who were creating businesses, they were part of an investment club, and it was so interesting to hear them talk about, they had these amazing businesses, but how hard it was to get venture capital. 30% of businesses in Senegal are owned by women, and yet 3% of venture capital moves to them. And I thought, that's just like what I hear when I talk to women in Silicon Valley. Less than 2% of venture capital goes to women-led businesses from Silicon Valley. You go to Rwanda, which I think I've been to at least a half a dozen times now, maybe more, so interesting to see what's happened because President Kagame, after the genocide, put in a quota that said 30% of our parliament will be women. Today, 60% of parliament are women. <laughs> and they will tell you, and the men will tell you, that it has changed society, the way they view women. The head of the Kigali Bank, the most powerful bank, the largest bank in Rwanda, is headed by a woman. And so I see the changes happening, but we're not getting them quickly enough and we're not getting them globally quickly enough around the world. So let's, let's pivot to, to the US. And I think obviously everybody's very familiar with the Gates Foundation. You also, you founded and, and, um, and chair Pivotal Ventures, which is really focused on the US and advancing women and people in, of color here. Um, Last time you were here in 2014, you were talking to us about Family Planning Summit in London. You'd raised billions of dollars for contraceptives for distribution in the developing world. And fast forward to today, and where we're sitting here, um, this summer we saw the constitutional right to abortion being struck down by the Supreme Court. There's fear that contraceptives are in, in risk in certain states, um, and that there's going to be um, more restrictions there. So. Given everything that you know globally that you've seen about the correlation of reproductive rights to sort of the broader advancement of women, um, what do you see ahead here? What, what, are we, what are we in for? So I think we, well, let me just talk, stand back for a minute and talk writ large. Mm -hmm. We have so long as a development community, which I've been part of for over 20 years through the Gates Foundation, we've so long, for long talked about empowering women. And I think we just need to stop and say, no, no, no. We have to make sure women have their full power in society. And what do I mean by that? I mean that at, in their homes and communities and at the very top levels of society, that women can control resources, make decisions, and shape policies and perspectives. I am convinced that Roe v. Wade would not have been rolled back, you know, a law for women's health on the books for almost 50 years. I was in Rwanda, frankly, when that got announced, and people in Rwanda were just shocked. Like, how can the US roll something like that back? Had the Supreme Court been put there by women, I don't think that decision would have, would have happened. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we keep talking in Congress about, oh, isn't it great we get another one or two percent of our congressional leaders are women. Well, it's good, but until we get to 50 percent being women, we don't have a single woman in the Senate who's black. 
Not a single woman. And yet I look out in society and there are a lot of amazing black women. So we can't <laughs> accept that anymore. We have to make sure women get into seats of power and take their power. And so that is what I'm committing my life to do, both through the foundation globally and Pivotal Ventures uh, in the United States. So Utah, I love this concept, not just putting women on the agenda, but women making the agenda. Is that politics, political, or, or does it just across the board? How, how do you just explain that to us? What does that mean? So I grew up in a household where my mom always said to me, and my sister as a young girl, set your own agenda or somebody else will. <laughs> and um, I see it as in politics, because that's where our public policy gets made. I think women need to be equal across the top. I think in media, because that's who tells our stories and shapes our perspective. Look at the difference since Shonda Rhimes has been writing for television, or Ava DuVernay with the movie she's making. I think finance, because finance, money is power. And so you need to have women at the top of financial institutions. I know Tashonda's going to speak later. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to have women at the top in computer science, because I look at what's happening. You know, My background is computer science and economics, but I look at the bias being baked into artificial intelligence, and I think, oh my gosh, this is just like the US Constitution. Look what happened. Mm -hmm. Women and minorities weren't represented there, and we're still fighting now to have true equality. You can't have the tech sector, which is so prevalent in our lives, run by essentially a small group of white men. So midterms are coming up. What is, what is your approach and what are the initiatives that you're involved in and, and pivotal, of course, when it comes to specifically the political side? Well, I'm, everything I do, and this is true both at Pivotal Ventures and at the foundation, we invest in partners. And so I'm investing in a number of partners who, well, and I am also putting directly money into candidates' elections, but I'm investing in partners who are looking at how do we get the harassment down in the system? How do we help women and people who are LGBTQ fight the harassment in the system? That's a big reason women don't run for office. And how do we make sure their political campaigns are funded at the same level as a man's? Because it is expensive to run for office. It's hard to run for office. So the partners I'm working through, though, that is our big agenda on the political front. OK. Um, I, I want to ask you also, you know, you, you're such an optimist. Mm -hmm. And yet you've seen and, and talked to so many people who are in such hard positions. And you see this you know, rollback of rights in, in this country. What is it that gives you that sense of optimism and hope as you do your work? Um, and have you always been an optimist? I think I've probably always been an optimist. I believe in human beings. We are the ones that change the world. And I believe in human ingenuity. And so I think when we talk about the real things going on in society, unpaid labor, you know, we expect women to care for children, de facto, right? And usually for the elderly. That's over 50 million caregivers in our country. And yet we don't create the right policies so they can have affordable quality childcare so they can care for the children and have a job. What I see though is more people talking out about it. We got this close to a paid family medical leave law in our country at the federal level. Those partners aren't going away. I'm not going away. We're going to keep fighting that. It was one white man that didn't get that passed. Um, so I'm just seeing a cadre now of women and like-minded men saying this shouldn't be. Society's going to be better off. The last thing I'll say just uh, or about this specifically is you know, again, so often the women's issue is the nice to do issue, the side issue, the back burner issue. I hear this essentially from prime ministers and presidents when I go places like the UN or I meet with them. But, you know, let's talk economics. We care economics. If women had the same lifetime earnings as men around the world, we'd add $170 trillion to the global GDP. So it also just makes economic sense. And so I think it takes all of us to talk about all the factors and then push them forward. And I see women, like in this room, who are in positions of power changing things inside of their companies. Mm -hmm. And I see men, like-minded men, saying, look, I know great female scientists. Let's make sure that we keep 
the resume pool open till we get more female scientists on the list, not just white male scientists before we hire. I just, I see society changing and we just need to keep pushing because it is humans and human ingenuity that changes society. So I know I mentioned all of the, the hardships that you've seen um, across the world and that, that you've dedicated yourself to. Um, you had your own set of personal challenges over the, the last few years and, and so definitely since we, we saw you here. Um, I shared with you earlier that when I got divorced, nobody other than my friends and family cared. <laughs> it wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a public person. Like, mm -hmm. I cannot imagine going through that um, more or less in, in, in the spotlight. And I'm curious, how has it changed you, if at all, um, as a leader, as you go around and you talk to women across the world? Has it changed your perspectives? I think what it has taught me is something I had always longed to do, which is to be my most authentic self in every place I show up. And it's funny, we have, you know, society is changing. We, we had set society up essentially in the US so that men, you know, kind of went off to work and the women stayed home and cared for the children. That has completely flipped now, right? Most um, couples who are partnered, 52% have dual incomes. And so when I think about what we used to say, even to men in the workforce, you kind of, you went into the workforce and you talked about work, you didn't talk about your personal life. Well, there have to be boundaries around that, of course, but I know people go into work and you want, you bring your whole self to work, you know? You do want to talk a bit about your kids and what's important to you and what's important in society. So I just feel unleashed to do that all the more now and to use both places, both the foundation to forward the agenda I believe in mm -hmm. and that we believe in as a foundation and the agenda that I care about in the United States through globally through the foundation and through Pivotal Ventures really working on the inequities that happen in this country. Um, I, I, I know that you're, you're co-chairing, by the way, if I ask for a show of hands, I'm not going to do this, but I'm sure there are other women here who have been divorced, but I don't think that we get other, uh, any hands up if I asked, do you co-chair a billion, multi-billion dollar foundation with your ex-husband? So, um, how is that going? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe there's something. I am. Um, I I do realize I'm charting unchartered waters, um, but I will say that we are both deeply committed to that institution. Look, my values are baked into that institution, and so what I know is that I have to show up. Mm -hmm. as my best self every single day. Um, I was saying backstage just briefly, I saw Esther Perel, who I know is gonna speak on this stage. I just finished her master class mm -hmm. about relationships, and one of the things she talks about is power, right? So I both am gonna have, I both have a relationship with my former uh, husband at work, and hopefully eventually I will have a relationship, you know, personally with somebody outside of work, but we have to think about power inside of a relationship and how do you share that and share that collaboratively. And so I spend a little more time thinking about that today. But the other thing I will say at the foundation is we have an amazing board now, we have incredible governance, and so I also know it's possible. Yeah, and, and that actually brings me to my next question. Um, Bill Gates made some headlines just recently at a philanthropy conference talking about how the foundation is not going to live beyond the next 25 years or what, you know. I, I realize this was, this was baked into sort of your original intention, it sounds like, but what is that all about? Like, explain to us how this works and what, your, what it says about your approach to philanthropy, that this was not meant to be, you know, your, your name put on something to live for all eternity. You want to have impact in your lifetime. Right. So, first of all, just to be clear, yes. <laughs> the governance documents of the foundation, which I'm a signator, a co-signator on, I'm a co-chair, say that it will last till 20 years after the death of the last of us. Got it. So, that is the current stated plan. Um, but the intention is that the resources that have been amassed from Microsoft that have ended up, for whatever reason, in both of our hands, that those resources will return to society. And both he and I have thought for a long time, we can't predict the problems 100 years from now. I, we couldn't have predicted some of the things that happened in the last five years. So we want to solve today's problems. And what we know is that they're enormous and they're even bigger, frankly, 
post-pandemic because of both the health shocks, but really the economic scarring. One, for instance, there is, you know, there are many more people this year that will go hungry than last year because of the fuel and fertilizer and food crisis coming out of the Ukraine war. 150 million more women will go hungry than men. So what I, my job as a co-chair is to say, okay, thus what do we do about it so we don't just work on hunger writ large, but we make sure that food and nutritious food gets into women's hands, because guess what? Women not only feed themselves, but they decide who eats in the family and what they eat. Okay. And thank you for clarifying. That's okay. <laughs> I, I, I assume he wasn't, you know, prophesying a uh, future demise, right? Like that's not something that an AI... No. No. Good. I think okay. he was that thinking something and yeah. said it before we have made a decision. Gotcha. So. All right. It <laughs> that happened. won't happen. It happened. <laughs> Do we have a question for Melinda in the audience? Elise, we'll bring a microphone over to you and if you could introduce yourself. Hi, Elise Hi. Nelson, Hi, CEO of Vital Voices. Thank you, Melinda, for using your platform and your full force. And I'm so thrilled to have your most authentic power Thank on these you. issues. But as you know, it's all about money, right? Yep. Women can't get to power without the money. And we know that only 2% of development dollars, charitable um, giving goes to women and women's organizations. You obviously have, you are not in that category. You've done far more. But how do we get the rest of, you know, whether it's corporate foundations, private foundations, to do the same, to follow suit and to realize this is the issue of our lifetime? I think we all have to use our voices. I think we have to keep pushing. I think you form grassroots organizations like Moms Rising saying this is what's right. Uh, Rishma's here, she has a Moms Marshall plan. I think you get inside of corporations, corporations starting to say this is what's right for our employees, not just in the US but globally. And I think it's also by demonstrating. So part of the reason I'm using my capital and being so vociferous about it, and you're seeing some other women do that who have means in their hands, like we are, we are unbelievably privileged to have these, these means in our hands. You see them living their values in society. And I think by doing that, then you see others follow. But it's gonna take all of us. This is, you know, we're pushing against barriers that are baked into society writ large. And um, we have to name and speak our truths if we're going to change that. Um, I, I want to end here by throwing out some numbers. Um, since the Gates Foundation started more than two decades ago, you've pro provided more than $60 billion in, in grants. Your endowment is more than $50 billion, and last year you committed an additional $50 billion collectively. Um, and you've also committed $1 billion of your money to Pivotal. These are astounding numbers. The level of impact that these numbers have is just incredible. And I just want to hear from you, I mean, you touched on this already, but what else can women in the room do today, whether it's in this country or they're looking you know, more globally? How do they have impact? Okay, so let me just add one thing to what you said about the amount of money. That is not just the resources from Microsoft. That is also Warren Buffett's money. Yes, collectively. Sorry. Collective. I'm, you know, no, no, no yeah. I'm not correcting you. I'm just saying <laughs> it's really important for us to recognize that because he believes in women having their full power, and he has for a long time. So what I would say to all of you collectively is wherever you sit, inside a corporation, if you're a policymaker, if you're a mom who works, Empower people around you. Use your resources, use your voice, vote for the right people who you think should be at the top, get others to vote, bring young women along with you. Any of us that have platforms, we need to open them to other leaders, global leaders, female leaders, young women coming up behind us. This is not a one generation and it's gonna solve this problem. It's gonna take all of us to move forward in the world. Thank you so much, Melinda. Thank you. <laughs>